Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my, um, I'm glad to welcome you tonight. My name is Tony Bosnick from the Department, uh, or from the Office of uh, uh, social ministry and uh, welcome you to the third installation of our parish mission uh, Encountering Jesus on your journey tonight. Deacon Kimbetovich will speak about reading and praying the Word of God We're going to just take a, a brief moment now to open up with a, a Presentation from our parish choir. What a great day it will be during this time more people will undoubtedly be signing in so this is a good time to uh, be entertained by the parish choir and allow others mm -hmm. to still sign in what a great day it will be when we sing together again what a great day it will be when we sing together again what a great day it will be when we sing together again. Okay, thank you. That was a nice way to begin this um, evening's presentation. I just wanted to give you a few of the um, ground rules that we have uh, with regard to tonight's presentation. The first is that it is being recorded. So everyone, everyone knows that and um, recognizes that th this recording will be placed on the parish website. The second point would be, please uh, go to the instructions at the bottom of your screen and uh, stop video. Um, so that, that way our pictures aren't there and they're distracting from the main speakers. And the third would be, we would ask you to mute um, your uh, sound so that it doesn't, the uh, recording doesn't pick up any extraneous sounds, which occurred last week. So um, those three things, which being recorded, uh, stop video and ask you all to um, mute your sound. The um, 
Our, our next thing is that we were asking Father John to give the opening prayer, but I'm not sure that Father John is here yet. I don't see his name. And he's coming over from the church, uh, from uh, Stations of the Cross. So, you know, it could be that um, he's been delayed. And that being the case, I think um, unless, you know, still, I, I don't see his name. Why don't we ask um, Deacon Jim to lead an opening prayer and then to begin his presentation a little bit off of our schedule, but I think that's the best way to proceed at this point. So Deacon Jim. Sure, thank you, uh, Tony, and thank you, Melissa. Why don't we begin as we do in all things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together, and indeed, what a great day it will be when we get together to sing again. And that day is coming uh, with the advent of the vaccines. And we thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ, for giving us that ability to, uh, to understand your creation and to be able to adjust creation in order to address this pandemic that we've been dealing with for the past year. Uh, and also, we thank you for this opportunity to break open your word, your scriptures, to better understand you and, and learn how we can indeed encounter you, Jesus Christ, through, on, your journey, on our journey uh, by utilizing the scriptures. And we ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. And so I'm gonna uh, go ahead and, and share a screen here. Um, the uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to use some slides for the beginning portion of this and then i'm going to basically talk to you uh for the, about the last half of the the talk this evening if we're going to look at scriptures in the bible as a way to encounter jesus on our journey in life it makes sense that we spend a couple of minutes discussing the bible and scriptures and and uh, get, a, get a little understanding of what they are and, and how, how they've come together. And so I'm going to, uh, if we look at the Bible, it's very interesting. As, as, as everyone on this call knows, there are two Testaments to the Bible. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, you know, when we buy a Bible, and that could be the, you know, the New American Bible, uh, we buy a book. But it's really not a book. It's a collection of books. And it's a collection of books that were uh, formed over a very, very long period of time. Uh, in the Old Testament, for example, the first book was attributed actually as the author of Moses uh, around the year 1400 to 1450 BCE, before Christ's birth. Uh, and then this, the second book of Maccabees, uh, which is also in this Old Testament, uh, is dated somewhere around 125 to 150 BCE. And so the Old Testament is really a living history of the Israelites all the way from the exile coming out of Egypt, all the way up and nearly to the, the birth of Christ. They went through you know, the, the making of a king, they went through the building of two temples, they went through two exiles, uh, they, they just had a tremendous history, and we participate with them and walk with them in that history through these inspired books of the Old Testament. And so there are 46 of these books, and so even though we buy the Bible, we get a book, uh, they're in the canon or the approved list of ins inspired scriptures, which is really what the canon is. It's a list of the books um, that are canonical or the Word of God. There are 46 of them in the Old Testament, spanning 1,300 years, just an amazing length of time. And given when this occurred, it's truly amazing that we even have these books to read and to share and to understand the Old Testament that foreshadows the new, that foreshadows Christ. And then we come to that New Testament, which is after the birth of Christ. And the first writing that, that we have are really letters from Paul that date around 50 AD, which is roughly 17 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And then we come to the Gospels. In the last Gospel, John, 
was written somewhere around the turn of the first century, roughly 67 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, through over a period of 50 years. And, you know, depending on when that Gospel of John was written, the church was actually on its fourth or fifth pope. Uh, and so the scriptures were written while the church was being formed. And the church, you know, they, they came out of the church because it's a story of the life of Jesus. And then it's a story of the apostles taking that mission out and Paul taking that mission out and creating churches not only in the, within the Jewish community, but also in the diaspora within the Gentile community. And so we see this tremendous amount of period of time and tremendous history. Um, and we know through the church, through the teaching authority, that Revelation is closed with the death of the last apostle. So we're not expecting any more books of a Bible or a Third Testament uh, or a newer New Testament or anything. The other thing that's interesting about the Bible is when it was written, it was just a stream of words. Uh, there were no chapters, no verses, not even punctuation in, in many instances. And so the chapters that we see today were, didn't exist until the 13th century. And the verses, the numbered verses, didn't exist until the 16th century. And so when we say we're going to read you know, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, within a minute or two, each of us can get to that within our Bibles. But that wasn't possible. That's a relatively new experience in history that, that that was possible. And so also when we talk about the word of God, we see it in translations. You know, we use the New American Bible. There's the King James Bible. There's the Jerusalem Bible. There are a lot of different Bibles and translations, but they face a really, really daunting challenge because the actual inspired text the actual word of God was that handwritten original text, which by and large has been lost to time. We have some fragments uh, that can date back to the original, but not much more. And so when I look at the Old Testament scriptures, the oldest copy uh, in, Ar in Hebrew and Aramaic dates to the 10th century uh, uh, after Christ. And so, you know, it's, it's 900 years after Christ almost 2,500 years after some of the books were written. Uh, and the oldest, uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls were a tremendous discovery in Qumran. Uh, they discovered almost a complete version of uh, Isaiah that was dated back to 200 BC before Christ. But the original of Isaiah was written at 740 BCE. So it, even this 200 year old copy that was found uh, was 500 years after the, uh, the actual writing of that book. In the New Testament as well, the oldest complete Bible copy is a fourth century parchment book in the Vatican Library. And the oldest copy of the Vulgate, which is that Latin version of the Bible um, that uh, St. Jerome uh, put together, uh, dates from the eighth century. And so when the Bible scholars, the exegetes, go to say, I want to do, I want to really look at this, um, this uh, translation. They really can't go back to the original, original text because the original, original text doesn't exist. And so they can go back as far as they can to, to try to understand the translations that they, uh, that they have. If we look at, um, we see somebody's uh, needs to mute. Um, the, uh, the council of, goes back to the Council of Rome. I'm sorry. Um, it goes back in 382 under Pope Damasus. Uh, the Council of Rome assembled to, 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 come, to basically identify and define those lists of canonical books, those lists of books that were truly inspired. And so if Jesus died in 33 AD, it wasn't until 382, until that New Testament as we know it today was defined and those books were defined of the New Testament. And after that council, Damasus asked St. Jerome to produce a reliable and consistent text to translate that original Greek and Hebrew into Latin. 
And you know, why Latin? Because it was the vernacular language of the day and it became known as the Latin Vulgate. And from that period of time, all the way up until the 1500s, that was the Christian Bible. Uh, that which St. Jerome put together that Latin Vulgate. Now it was translated into a few other languages along the way, but that was the Bible. And then after Luther uh, in, in his translations and some of the Old Testament books uh, being called Apocrypha or the Hidden, uh, in 1546, the Council of Trent um, basically said Jerome's Vulgate translation was the Roman, the only authentic and official Bible of the Latin Church, of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. And so the, the coming together of what we know of as the Bible today took a very, very long time uh, to come together. It's truly an amazing thing that we actually have it today, given the history and how it was put together. The other interesting fact is the Bible, if you, the first, was one of the first printed books on the Gutenberg movable type printing press in 1455, a Latin version. Since that time, there have been over 5 billion copies of the Bible in old form that have been sold. And since 2000, the Bible, it sells about 100 million copies a year. We never hear it on a bestseller list, but indeed, the Holy Bible uh, is in many people's homes, uh, yeah, over 5 billion of them out there in circulation. Uh, many of our homes have one or more Bibles. And as you can see in the chart on the right, uh, the Bible has been translated into many, many languages uh, and many more are in progress. So it truly is this word of God, this experience of walking with Jesus, truly walking with Jesus in the gospel, meeting the people he met, talking to the people he talked to, seeing how he reacted to situations, seeing the, his disciples and how they began the church and the Acts of the Apostles, uh, some of the difficulties encountered Paul and some of the churches that, that he founded. Uh, we truly get an idea of that first you know, 50 years of, of the church and the growth of the church uh, in the Holy Bible. And there is no better example of the deposit of faith. In the deposit of faith, we talk about scripture, obviously, the word of God. Uh, we also talk about tradition with a capital T, that which was believed everywhere by everyone, which is tradition. And then the teaching authority of the church, that big word magisterium. And all that really means is it's the Pope together with the bishops, form the teaching authority of the church. So the popes and the bishops together form the magisterium of the church. Because without tradition and the teaching authority of the church, we would never have the Bible today. Because if Jesus, as far as we know, wrote down nothing and gave us you know, no writings that, that he himself did, and it was over a period of years that the faith was passed on from one to the other to the other, which is tradition. I handed on to you that which was given me, as Paul says many times uh, in, in his letters. And so it was handed on person to person, and then it was written down that was, was handed on. And so when it came time for Damasus to say, which are the truly canonical books in the uh, those books that are inspired in the New Testament, the way he came up with those 27 books of the New Testament was, can they be tied back to the apostles? Can we tie them back? Have they been used in worship and prayer uh, since, since the time of Christ? And so there, they were used that tradition to define which of these books truly were inspired, the inspired word of God and formed the canon or the, the list of books in the Bible, and it was the magisterium or the, magisterium or the teaching authority of the church, the Pope and the bishops, who said yes in that Council of Rome, these are the books. And so without that deposit of faith, of scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, there's no way we would have had uh, the New Testament today. As, as 
And the other thing that's really happened since the middle of the last century uh, is that the Bible scholars of the world, Jewish, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, you, you name it, the Bible scholars get together in these Bible commissions and they have come to an agreement on what is the, you know, the, the oldest uh, foundational text that we can have of each of the books of the Bible so that every new translation basically starts from the same foundation of text. Uh, so it, it really has pr promoted the promulgation of, of very, very uh, faithful uh, translations of, of the Bible along the way. And I think there's a, I'd like to basically read a, a scripture passage as, I, as a transition from using the slides to basically talking with you about praying with, with the gospel. And it's a story from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, um, starts at verse 26. And it's about Philip and an Ethiopian. And it goes like this. It says, Then the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and head south on the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, the desert route. So he got up and set out. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, that is, the queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury, who had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go and join up with that chariot. And Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah and the prophet, uh, Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? So he invited Philip to get in and sit with him. And so it's important that when we look at scripture, we understand that we also need instruction as well. And so I'm going to stop sharing now and, and just talk with you. Um, you know, from the very beginning of time, from the very beginning of creation, our communication with the Father has been through the Son, through Jesus, in the, in the Spirit. It's been through the Word. We can go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 where it says then god said let there be light and there was light that word let god said god said let there be light two verses later in genesis chapter 1 verse 5 god called the light day again called the word and the darkness he called night we go to the acts of the apostles where it says 40 years later an angel appeared to him in the desert near Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning bush. And when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look at it, the voice of the Lord, and the voice, the word, the voice of the Lord came, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And so we see that every interaction that has happened with the world, with creation, with us as humans, has come through the Word in the Spirit. And the Bible is the Word of God. St. Augustine wrote, you recall that one and the same Word of God extends throughout Scripture, that it is one and the same utterance that resounds in the mouths of all the sacred writers. And that's from the very first words of Exodus, to the very final words of Revelation, that they're all the same utterance that resounds from the mouths of the sacred writers. They're individual books, but it's everything that God through the Holy Spirit uh, says we need for our salvation. It was inspired to be written. Now, when we say inspired word of God, we don't mean that the Holy Spirit was holding on to the writer and, and made him do exactly what he wanted. No, but it was inspired that the writer wrote what was meant to be written in those books. And so they're not, you'll see contradictions in things like who was at the tomb first at the resurrection. But the point is all the important parts of our salvation uh, are inerrant. There are no errors. And so 
Jesus is that word made flesh, true God and true man, God, true man like us in all things but sin. And Pope, Pope Francis invited Catholics across the world to deepen their appreciation and their love and their witness to God and his word. And that's why by papal decree, the third Sunday in ordinary time each year is to be observed as a special day devoted to the celebration and the study and the dissemination of the word of God. It's through scripture that we come to a, have a deeper relationship with Jesus, who is the word of God. We walk with him on our faith journey. We become one with him when we, when we utilize scripture. And St. Jerome, who wrote that, uh, you know, translated that Latin Vulgate, um, through whom the first complete Bible, as we know it, was translated and published, summed it up this way. He said that, you know, ignorance of scripture is really ignorance of Christ. And when, you know, when we pray, when we say a Hail Mary, when we see an Our Father, when we see a Rosary, when we say a Chaplet, whatever it is, when we pray, we speak to Christ. When we read scripture, God speaks to us. We encounter God, we encounter Jesus every time that we read scripture because it is God. The word made flesh. And so, you know, scripture is not just words on a page. Scripture came out of living, breathing communities, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's, you know, it's a living interaction with Jesus himself. I remember, you know, one, most, some of us here obviously remember Monsignor Ralph Keener. Uh, he was here at St. Francis for 26 years. Just an amazing, amazing man. Um, you know, I've always said, if he's not a saint, there's no hope for me. Uh, and he truly is. And, and I heard him, I assisted him at hundreds of masses. And uh, two things he always said in every one of his homilies, he said, you know, God will always love us and will always be willing to forgive us. Uh, and the second thing he said many times is, you know, the church did not come out of the Bible the Bible came out of the church. And somehow that sounds smug when we first hear it, but it's true. The church wasn't founded on the Bible. The Bible was founded on the early church. It was founded on the gospels that the Christ and, and his, what he did in, in following Christ through his public ministry. And then through the apostles as they took this concept of a church and made it a reality you know i always laugh and chuckle a little bit when you know when they were at caesarea philippi and they were outside of uh, israel actually uh and they were sitting there and jesus looks at peter and he says peter you're a rock and upon my rock i'll build a church and peter was this ready fire aim kind of guy very impulsive and i can imagine him just sitting there saying yes lord and then Jesus walks away and he looks to James and John next to him and he leans over and said, what's a church? Uh, you know, because there really was no, no guidebook of what to do. They followed the Holy Spirit. You know, after Pentecost Sunday, the Spirit inspired them and they took this message out, but there was no guide. Jesus just said, you know, baptize all people in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And so they took this out in and developed the church. You know, one theology professor sums it up this way. He said, the word of God is living and efficacious. It's not simply about intellectual concepts or doctrine about God. It is rather God's self-disclosure. So the New Testament was inspired by a life of a man who lived 2,000 years ago and who lives more fully today. Jesus of Nazareth wrote not a word of the 27 volumes in the New Testament, yet every single word is there because of him. Saint Caesarius of Arles, who is an archbishop and father of the church, made an amazing statement. He said, you know, the word of God is not to be treated as inferior to the body of Christ. Let me repeat that. The word of God is not to be treated as inferior to the body of Christ. We had a 
associate pastor now called a parochial vicar at St. Francis many, many years ago. Uh, his name was Father Charlie Muzzy, a wonderful priest. And he was uh, training some lectors in a class. And the, the lectors had this habit of when they approached the ambo, they would bow to the tabernacle and approach the ambo and begin the reading. And he asked them, he said, why do you bow to the tabernacle? He said, because the proclamation of the word that you're doing, that word being proclaimed is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. It's not to be treated as inferior to the body of Christ. And so what he was basically saying is when you bow to the tabernacle, you're somehow saying that that is more of Christ than the proclaimed word. And he's, you know, he basically said, we shouldn't do that because people should realize what that proclaimed word really is. And Ralph and you and, and the lectors that you so ably uh, enable uh, do a wonderful job of proclaiming that word of the Lord. And the fathers take it a bit further and say, you know, the liturgy or the mass becomes the fitting place where Jesus as the word of God is fully encountered. First in the scriptural flesh and blood of the Logos, that is the, the word of God, Jesus. And then in the celebration of that word in the bread and wine of the Eucharist. Think about that. We encounter Jesus twice. We encounter Jesus first in that scriptural flesh and blood of the word, the Logos. And then in the celebration of that word in the bread and wine of the Eucharist, Jesus is fully present in the proclamation of the word. That's all the readings. And he's also fully present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. We call the Eucharist and we say it you know, appropriately as the source and summit of our Catholic faith. But if not for scripture, if not for the Gospel of John, the Bread of Life discourse, if not for what Paul says in his letters, is not, you know, the bread that we eat, the true body and the blood, the wine that we drink, true flesh. If we didn't have scripture and we didn't know about the Last Supper, how would we know about the Eucharist? How would we know about the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? It comes through us through that revelation of scripture. And so the fathers go on to say, we consume Jesus through our minds and hearts in his word and consume him physically, body, blood, and divinity through the reception of the Eucharist. You know, today we're asked and reminded that the scripture is alive. It's not just words on a page. It's alive, it wants to jump out at us, it wants to be part of us, it wants to be, you know, have our heart and, and be one with, with the scriptures that it are most part of our being. And praying the scriptures is our opportunity to listen and converse with God, to walk with him, to journey with him in our faith journey because when we, when we read the Gospels, we are truly walking with Christ. And we are, you know, we're with him. When we're reading the Acts of the Apostles, we are with the very early church as it's coming together, and Paul, and how the communities uh, you know, grew, and, and some of the, you know, the, the deviations that they, they had, and how he brought them back uh, into the, onto the course. And so when we think about praying the scriptures, they probably say, you know, where do I start? You know, how do I begin? I don't know how, you know, I don't know enough. And once again, St. Jerome comes to the rescue because he said, and this is beautiful. I, I ask you to listen to this. The scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink without fear of drowning and deep enough for theologians to swim in without ever reaching the bottom. Now Jesus will welcome us to the scriptures regardless of where we are, regardless of where we begin. And there's a monk and desert father, Abba Pullman, who said, the nature of water is soft, 
and that of stone is hard. But if water ceaselessly falls drop by drop, the stone is worn away. And so it is with the word of God. It is soft and our hearts are hard. But the one who hears the word of God often opens his heart to the fear of God. And fear means awe and wonder, not being afraid of God, to the awe and wonder of God. One of the ways we can perhaps start is with Lexio Divina, divine reading. It's a way that we, uh, we pick, and it was started first by St. Gregory of Nyssa in 330 to 395, and encouraged by St. Benedict, the founder of the Benedictine order. And it suggested that perhaps we spend uh, 30 minutes uh, doing Lexio Divina. And it's, it's basically taking a, a piece of scripture uh, whether that's just a snippet, a word, a phrase, a verse, a, a chapter, some small part of scripture. And we take 30 minutes out of our lives and we reflect and we quiet ourselves down. And we read it first and listen carefully for any words or phrases that seem to jump out at us. It's important not to force this, but to wait patiently and let God give us general guidance. And after we've spent a couple of times in the Lexio or the reading, we read it a second time and reflect, the Meditatio. And we focus further on the points that we became aware of in our first reading. And, you know, often we just reread a few verses to reflect on what God has nudged us with. And then after a period of time, we respond with a third reading, it's time to respond. Perhaps we want to journal our thoughts here to know very fond to where we're uh, prone to forgetting, obviously, in, in future days. But we're, God's calling us to an action here through these readings. And we should understand the action that we're being, being called to. And then finally, it's contemplation, contemplatio. And that's where we read it again. And then we sit in silent contemplation. That's not a time of prayer or meditation. You just sit quietly, quietly and let God work within us. And when our minds start to wander, we kind of bring our minds back in contemplation. And the catechism emphasizes that con contemplative prayer is silence or silent love in which the Father allows us to dwell in his Son, to become one with his Son, to be infused with the Holy Spirit and experience the closest thing to heaven that we can on this earth. And I'll close with a quote from St. Athanasius that says, these books are the fountains of salvation so that he or she who thirsts may to be satisfied with the oracles contained within them. I'd like to close by um, sharing a, a few books that you might think of that Father John has shared uh, that you might consider uh, utilizing as well. And uh, the first is The Bible Companion by Ronald Witherup. And the next is The Catholic Guide to the Bible, Father Lucafar. And the third is you can understand the Bible, meaning you can, meaning I can understand the Bible. And those are three books and Melissa will, will actually post those books as well. And so I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity to speak with you uh, this evening uh, on utilizing the Bible in, in your faith journey and your journey with Jesus through this Lenten season and beyond. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you, Deacon Jim. I was wondering if anyone has any questions. Pose. I'll turn this over to Tony to moderate that. Okay. Actually, we do already do have a couple questions in, and you're invited to um, send more in on the chat function, or perhaps toward the end as time gets uh, close to raise your hand or indicate you'd like to ask a question. But the first question we have for uh, Deacon Jim is kind of a, a fun one. I can't wait to hear how he answers this. Um, do you have a favorite book of the Bible and why? Do you have a favorite book of the Bible and why? 
I do. You know, my first name is James, and, and my favorite book of the Bible is James. Um, <laughs> you know, and it has nothing to do with it being my namesake. Or, uh, but uh, when I read James, I find that it's very human. Uh, you you get into real life situations and you get very practical guidance in, in the book of, of James. Uh, and so I find that book uh, very refreshing. Whenever I hear a quote and it resonates with me, I look at where that quote's from and sure enough, most times it's from, from James. So that's my favorite book. Okay, now uh, here's another question. Um, how would you recommend the best way to read the Bible? Uh, in other words, is it best uh, to be studied alone uh, in a small group, a combination of ways? Do you have a, any recommendations on the best um, ways that might help people to actually study the Bible? I think that some of that depends on our individual personalities. Uh, some of us um, really can, you know, can reflect well individually. Um, I found that in most cases, if there's a small group uh, that studies a particular book of, of the Bible together uh, and opens it up, that can be very, very um, enlightening. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be said about, you know, studying together because, you know, as Jesus said, when two or more of you are gathered in my name, I am there. So not only is he present in the scriptures, but he's present among people looking at it and you can get more thoughts and ideas. But I also think there's a lot to be gotten through like Lexio Divina, which can be done in groups uh, or individually. And so I think there's, um, there's a place for individual study of the Bible, especially if, you know, if you're having a challenge in a situation uh, and, and, you know, you can reflect on a particular part of scripture that speaks to you, uh, can be very, very helpful. But I also think that having, you know, groups, uh, together is, is helpful also. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's, I think it's a combination. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question that has come in on the uh, chat is, um, what book preferably illustrated about the Bible do you recommend for young children? And the person also says, thank you for this uh, inspiring, wonderfully inspiring discussion. But the question is, uh, what book preferably illustrated about the Bible do you recommend uh, for young children? Actually, I don't remember the name of it, um, you know, but we had it for uh, Tristan and Tyler. Um, Maybe Patrice remembers the name of it. I don't know, but I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't remember the name of it. I can I can get it, um, but um, you know it's been all, it's, it, given that you know my grandchildren are now in in high school. Uh, I don't deal with the young children as much, but uh, I know there was one uh, you know annotated book of the Bible for children, but I, I don't recall its name. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, Patricia, uh, do you remember the name of the book? Uh, or you could, well, you could if you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you could either unmute or type it into the chat room for everyone to see, whichever, if you remember that. Uh, in oh. the meantime, uh, Patricia? Okay, I, go ahead. I don't remember it, but I can Google it and see if I can come up with it. Um, and if not, we could always ask Susan and she would be able to share that information because she, I think, is the one where I got the name of the Bible from. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, you know, you could send that in and we can post that also on the uh, web once the um, uh, presentation is done. Now, another question that has come in is um, how do the various translations of the Bible differ? And this is referring to the, um, the designations of uh, Protestant version and Catholic version. And I just throw out another one. Is there a difference with an Orthodox among the Orthodox? So, Well, yeah, that's a very interesting question. The, uh, you know, we stop at the one and two Maccabees, but there's, uh, there are Orthodox versions of the Bible that have Maccabees three and four, and they have 150 first Psalm, for example. 
So yes, there are there are other uh, versions of the Bible in the most Orthodox space that actually have more books uh, than the Catholic Bible. Uh, and so, yes, there are. Uh, and but the interesting thing is, if you look at the uh, at the Catholic Bible, has 46 books in the Old Testament. The uh, the Protestant Bible has 39. Uh, and uh, you know, but the, the New Testament between the Protestant Bible and the Catholic Bible is virtually the same. And so the question is, why does one have fewer books than the other? And when uh, when the, the canon was being formed, there was a version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. It was the Greek version of the Jewish scriptures uh, that included books written in both Hebrew and in uh, Greek. And so, uh, the, you know, the Septuagint, Septuagint had the 46 books. And, you know, that was a Bible that, that Jesus used, and it was from the Jewish um, the Jewish uh, scriptures, uh, because at the time of Jesus, there were more Jews in the diaspora, meaning outside of Israel, than there were in the in the Holy Land. And so, uh, but after the temple was destroyed uh, in 70 AD and the priesthood was wiped out by the Romans, the Jews had a council, what they called the Council of Jamnia around the year 100. And they form the what is the, the Jewish scripture and the Jewish canon. And so basically what they said was that the official canon, the inspired texts were uh, you know, kind of ended with the this building, the end, end of the second uh, uh, exile and the, and the construction of the sub, second temple. So the, those books that were written in Hebrew uh, that were in their canon. And so when um, when Luther came along and said, you know, sola scriptura, scriptura, basically, faith is determined by the Bible alone, uh, he wanted to have a, you know, a, a version of the Bible and a translation of the Bible that he found the official uh, faithful. And so when he came to these books that were in the Catholic Bible, but not in the Jewish scriptures after the year 100, he said, well, what do I do with these books, you know, between 39 and 46? And so he had three choices. He could have either said, well, I'm going to get rid of them because they're not in the Jewish canon. Therefore, uh, they're not inspired and from his perspective. Uh, he could have included them, which we know he didn't. Or he could have had them in, the, in his Bible in some way, shape, or form. And he chose to include them in his Bible. So if you go to the original King James version of the Bible, you'll find that the Old Testament has 46, as their, I'm sorry, 39 books. The New Testament has the 27. And in between the two is a section called the, 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 the hidden, um, the apocrypha, the apocryphal, the hidden books. And so he included them and he said he didn't believe they were inspired word of God, but they are holy books worthy to be studied. And so that's kind of how, uh, you know, the, the Catholic faith wound up with uh, 46 books and the, the Protestant Bible wound up with the 39 books. And over the years when the Bibles were printed, they just kind of left out the, the Apocrypha. But you can still find versions of the Protestant Bible that say with Apocrypha, with those books. Okay, we're running out of time now, but I think uh, we'll have what, time for one this last question. Um, you mentioned the differences in the Bible. Uh, what are some of the major, um, what, what ways does that impact the beliefs that are held by Catholics and Protestants? Does that have the number of books and the differences have an impact on what uh, we believe? The, um, some of the, the New Testament, basically the Gospels and the letters and the epistles and, uh, and the Acts uh, are the very same. And so the, it really has no difference in, in you know, what we believe and teach about uh, Jesus Christ. But some of the Greek texts uh, were used to, uh, you know, to basically uh, talk about things like purgatory and praying for the dead and so forth. And so there are some things in the Greek text, Old Testament text, 
that are not in those 49, those 39 books of the, the Protestant Bible that, that we believe, like, uh, you know, the, the purgatory and, uh, you know, those types of things. And so there is some difference of, of some of the beliefs, but the fundamental beliefs of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, I don't think there's, uh, there's any difference there. Okay, uh, uh, Deacon Jim, thank you very much for taking the time both for the presentation and for the questions. Uh, I think Father John is going to say something at this point. Uh, Father John? All right. Well, I do want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And next week we have uh, Tony Bosnick, um, W. Babby Backlar. And Carolyn Brower there and talk about serving others in need. Okay. So we want to thank everyone for being here. It's been a wonderful thing and a wonderful discussion as well. So I thank I want to thank Deacon Jim for uh, taking the time to prepare this. And uh, this was it was I think it was, it was a quite good evening. So I'm gonna I have a closing prayer now, then I will let everyone go. Okay. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Pour your grace into our hearts, we pray, O oh Lord. We may be constantly be drawn away from unruly desires and obey by your own gift the heavenly teaching you give us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. We will end now. Um, and as people um, are signing off, uh, the choir will sing a song uh, called To Remembrance. So we can listen.